you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for your kindness toward us. We thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed at Calvary, Lord. Oh, God, and I come before you tonight with a prayer of repentance, Lord, that you would forgive us of all sin, Lord, and all iniquity. Anything, Lord, we've said or done or thought that is not like you, I pray tonight that you would forgive us of that sin, Lord, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that you would create in us a clean heart, Lord God, and give us a right spirit, Lord. Father, as we dive into your word today, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to understanding. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us revelation, Lord. Give us an understanding heart that we should take this word and apply it to our lives, that we should be transformed pleased and molded and shaped into your image, Lord God. Oh God, I pray that you have your way in this Bible study. We'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Thank you for coming out tonight. I know we got some people back there still kind of eating. Uh, somebody ought to pester them and say, hurry on up in Jesus' name. <clears throat> there's a time to eat and there's a time to read. Thank you, Jesus. There's a time to stuff your belly, and there's a time to sleep. There's a time for, I'm, I'm butchering Ecclesiastes right now, but y'all get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Everything, there's a season, and there's a time. But right now is a time for Bible study. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, uh, thank you, Brother Reggie, for covering me, covering, filling in for me last week. Uh, this time last week, even with how I'm talking to you right now, my voice is mostly gone. Uh, so I couldn't speak from, for, for much of anything, so... Huh? That that's what I heard. I watched I watched a little bit of it. I didn't get the end of it, but so so that's that's good. Uh, so we're gonna pick up right right where he left off with the birth of the church, the birth of the church, which is I hear he covered most of Acts chapter number two, the day of Pentecost. This is should be one of the most studied scriptures in the Bible. Acts chapter two should be one of the most studied chapters in the Bible. Um, because Jesus is, is establishing something. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Furthermore, um, it also is the first time that we see anyone being saved. The book of Acts is the only book where you'll find people being saved. You won't find it in Romans. You won't find it in Colossians. You won't find it in First or Second Corinthians. Uh, you won't. You won't find it in First or Second Thessalonians. None of the epistles will show you the event of someone being saved. It is only found in the Book of Acts, which means this: if you want to know what it looked like for someone to be born of the water and of the Spirit, the only book you can go to is the Book of Acts to see that happen in practice. The Gospels give you their recipe. The book of Acts shows you how the apostles followed the recipe to produce the result that Jesus said would produce, which is born again believers as part of the church. So one thing we have to recognize before we go forward is that there is an assumption in the New Testament, and this is the assumption. The assumption is that everybody who is a part of the church has experienced the new birth, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Am I making sense? So when Paul is writing to, say, the church at Rome, he's assuming because they are part of the church, they have been born again by the water and the spirit. Okay? When, when John, for example, is writing to believers in his epistles, he's writing to people who have the basic assumption that they have been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's an important, uh, important detail to get right especially when you're talking to people that maybe consider themselves as part of the church but never had that experience. You're not part of the church until you have been born again of the water and of the spirit. You are not born into, you're not part of the body of Christ. Let, let, me, let me prove, y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy right now. So let me, let me prove that to you. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, I'm just going to read this off the cuff. Um, I'll read the first Corinthians 12 verse four. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit and there are diversities of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all for to one. But okay. I, I, I missed all that. Let me go down. And then I miss it. Oh, yes. Here we go. I was just should have kept reading. 
For as the body is one, it hath many members, and all the members of that body, being many, are one, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. By one spirit we are all baptized into one body. So if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus, you're not part of the body. You might belong to a local organization called a church. You might have shaken the pastor's hand and filled out some documents to say, I'm joining this particular fellowship. But when we're talking about the church, biblically speaking, we're talking about the body of Christ. We've got to make that distinction because many people will think that when they're getting baptized, they're joining this church. That's not what that means necessarily. Though it's a good indication of which fellowship you should go to. But baptism is about putting you into the body of Christ, which should be the church, which is also why we can't necessarily accept people's criticisms of the church. All the church is weak. All the church is hypocrite. Anybody ever heard stuff like this? Come on, talk back to me. All the church, there's no love in the church. No, there's no faith in the church. The church, well, be careful. You're talking about Jesus' body. You're talking about his bride. Now, there may be some, some bad actors around the church, but we really get to decide if we're going to remain in the body. The church is fine. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he's the one that gets to add and remove it from this body as he sees fit. So I like studying going over the birth of the church because it lays out for us how we are actually placed into the body. But one of the things we've got to recognize is that Jesus gave mission to the church. It's called the Great Commission. We talked about that. After the day of Pentecost happened, we're going to see um, how they actually conducted their business. So let's go to Acts chapter number 3. And we're going to start here in verse number 1, if you could. Acts chapter, oh, you got to grab the mic. Acts chapter 3, verse number 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him and John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. All right, so let's pause right there. Now we have Peter and John. Where are they going? Why are they going to the temple, Brother John? The what? The hour of, everybody say the hour of prayer. Now, let me give you a little mini revelation. They didn't have watches like we have watches. <laughs> no, they didn't have, they didn't have like a, a, a digital clock like I'm looking at on the wall. They might have had a sundial. You just had to hope it was on, the, on, a, on a sunny day. I don't, I don't think they had Rolexes. I don't think they have Movados, Rolexes, no. So, in essence, it wasn't like an actual 60 minutes. It was like exactly. It was probably two to three hours span. <coughs> and notice it was a popular time to be at the temple. All of you apostolics, you. I just, I just like to point that out to tell you to come to prayer in Jesus' name. <laughs> come to the hour of prayer. Being the ninth hour, okay, and who do they find at the gate? A lame man carried from his mother's womb. And why were they there at the temple in the first place? Hmm. 
Hmm. I don't think they went there to pray. I don't think they went there to heal the man. They went there to preach. Because, and this, now why am I pointing this out? Because remember the commission, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Tear ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Go and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes. So their mandate is not to go and necessarily just join in with a prayer session and kind of keep their mouths shut and keep their mouths closed. They targeted this particular event because they knew there's going to be people there praying to God. And it's going to be a great opportunity to show the miracle power of God and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're now talk, we're, remember, this is not that far away from the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> so Peter and John, they're just like, all right, we're just coming to pray. I mean, they could have stayed praying where they were. By this time, there was already 3,000 souls added to the church. They wanted to have a prayer meeting. They could have had it unto the believers. But also, mind you, we're getting ready to find out that what they are preaching is not necessarily all that popular. So what they did, remember, fishers of men, you go to where the fish are. And you cast a net, okay? And so they came to this, they came to the temple at the hour of prayer, and then they saw this lame man, and what did the lame man want from them? He wanted money. And notice, it was Peter who got the guy's attention. Verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So this guy is expecting to receive $5 bill, $10 bill. But what did Peter say? Silver and gold have I none. But what? Such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You got to, we need to study that and make that part of our own, our own approach to the miraculous. Our own approach. Notice that he didn't say, okay, we'll pray for your healing. We'll pray that, we'll pray that God would do it. Notice the faith of Peter. First of all, silver and gold have I not. A lot of us guys would have just gave him a couple of... <laughs> Gave him a couple of a couple of coins and and, and kept it moving. The American preachers can't say that silver and gold happen because they got silver and gold. <laughs> Praise God! And so the irony is they don't got what the guy really needs. This guy really needs healing. This guy really needs Jesus. So they said silver and gold have I none. But notice what he said: such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Notice he commanded. He commanded. He didn't ask God, God, give him his strength. He didn't ask Jesus, Jesus. He said, in the name of Jesus, you get up and walk. Speak to the mountain. Exactly. And that's been part of my, I got this revelation a few years ago that sometimes when it comes to the operation of the miraculous, we're doing it wrong. We're praying wrong. Because our pray, the way we do it is a demonstration of where our faith is. Well, understand that we have something. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you have something. It might not be silver and gold, <laughs> but you have something. And Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. So this opportunity, Peter and John, they, 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 they seize the opportunity to do what I think is already something that they have been doing. Because it's not the first time Jesus sent them out to heal. Remember back in John, I mean, Matthew chapter number 10, Jesus sent them out and gave them power to heal the sick and to cleanse the lepers and to raise the dead and cast out devils. So it's not that they had some practice doing this, but notice the non-hesitation. He said, look on us. We know you want money, but we, I got something better than money. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up. Get up off your feet. And the Bible says, and he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping, 
up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Look at verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as a lame man was, which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. So this miraculous event got the attention of everybody at the prayer meeting, which is again why I say I don't think they came there to pray. I think they came there to preach. And it was the power of God that got the attention of everybody at the meeting. This is how apostolic services are supposed to work. We don't sing and praise God just because we're trying to have a good time. We don't start off with praise and worship just because we like the particular songs and we're so emotional. We're trying to invoke the power and the presence of God that it would get the attention of everybody that's in the building. And once we have the attention, we can launch forward into the gospel. It is the miraculous that's supposed to be a part of our services and supposed to be a part of our outreach efforts. Which also goes to shows us that the miracles aren't supposed to happen in the building, not just only in the building. It's when we take, this happened outside. As, a, as Peter and John were walking in, can you imagine next time you're walking into Publix and there's somebody outside asking you for some money, Brother Elliot, and you're sitting there, you, you say, silver and gold, have I none? Such as I have, and boom, and, and the guy gets healed. Or suppose you go to the National Day of Prayer that they hold in Tampa, some event, and you're walking out there and somebody gets healed and the power of God shows up. That's where the miracles happen. They're not supposed to happen just at an altar call or just at a prayer meeting. Wherever you go, you carry something with you. Okay? So let's see what Peter does after, after God does this miracle through his hands. Verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Mm -hmm. Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Yep. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate. Uh. But when he was determined to let him go... But ye didn't deny the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witness. And his name through faith is his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Uh -huh. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. Mm -hmm. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath yeah. so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be, and be converted, converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, uh -huh. whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, uh -huh. which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things, whosoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. All right, pause there. Peter starts preaching. And good preaching, if you ask me. <laughs> which is, again, this is why they came. When Peter saw it, he said basically this. This man here stands before you whole because of the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob hath glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up and you denied him in the presence of Pil in the presence of Pilate he gives the credit to God for the man that was healed because that's what got their attention in the first place which confirms something that was spoken in the book of Mark the bible says God would work with them confirming their word with signs and wonders God will do miracles on behalf of the healed but God will also do miracles for the sake of the converted Meaning that miracles can be done as a testimony. How did this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. It happened by the name of Jesus. And Peter said, faith in the name of Jesus Christ has made this man stand before you whole. So now he's got a captive audience to preach to them the Jesus that they had delivered up. Look at verse 20, verse 13. Whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. 
when he was determined to let him go. He said, but you denied the Holy One, the just and desired a murderer to be granted. Who was that murderer? Barabbas. So Peter is reminding these Jews who were present during the time of Jesus' crucifixion that the guy that they see standing before you whole is made whole by the one that they chose to crucify and let Barabbas go. So in his preaching is conviction. In his preaching is the gospel showing that Jesus died for their sin. In his preaching is, is repentance. And he said to this, uh, verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come in the presence of the Lord. This is what Peter does. He preaches to a group of people who are at this time unbelievers. They believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. I'll say it again. They believe in God but they don't believe in Jesus Christ. In this particular, he said Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why? Because there are a lot of people named Jesus that day. Yeshua was a very popular name. He was salvation. Okay, so people called there, but they said, no, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, where is this happening? At the temple. You remember when Jesus used to preach at the temple? Whose attention would it get? Pharisees and the, sat and the high priests, and they don't like it. They don't like it when you come in and you start taking their influence and the people start respecting you more than they respect them. That's a problem. But do you think Peter and John cared? No. Which, is, which shows us another element of, the new, of this newly formed church. Being Christian was not the safe thing to do. It's not, it wasn't safe. It, you risked your life if you said you are someone of the way and you believed in Jesus. I know we don't think that it here in America, but uh, it's, it's true anyhow, which is why we were all fooled when it came to COVID because they all said, shut down your churches in the name of safety. Well, when, since when has it ever been safe? Well, you got to keep your people safe since when? If Jesus was more cared about keeping his people safe, he would have told them, just believe in me and hunker down in your little shelters until I come. That's not Jesus' priority is our safety. He said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. <laughs> he said, they're going to they're gonna deliver you up to be afflicted. They're going to kill you with the sword. That's a controversial opinion, but our safety is not God's primary concern. Why? Because safety is baked into self-preservation of life. And the first thing we're supposed to do is deny ourselves. Jesus said, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. Oh, Matter of fact, Paul said, when they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction upon them as travail, a woman with the child. So we really shouldn't be hedging our bets as far as safety is concerned. There are missionaries in the world still right now, we can't even say their names out loud due to them being persecuted in the nations that they're preaching. I think we need a wake-up call. It was never safe to believe in Jesus. And I think that that, that environment's going to come to America. So... Now the pot is being stirred up. We see in Acts chapter 3 the first notable miracle in the Bible after Jesus, uh, excuse me, after the church is born, done by the hands of Peter and John. So let's go to Acts chapter 4 and see uh, what was the result of this. Acts chapter 4 verse 1, if you could. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being uh -huh. grieved that they taught the people yep. and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Uh -huh. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, ah. for it was now eventide. Mm -hmm. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Pause. So we had 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. First day, the church, Holy Ghost, upper room. One, no, excuse me. Let's, let's start from the beginning. We had 12, if you count Matthias. By the time we made it to the upper room, it was 120, okay? 
After the Holy Ghost was pouring out, remember it happened on the day of Pentecost, and all the Jews, people had to be there on the day of Pentecost, and they got a harvest that day from 122. 3,000 souls were added to the church, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now this is the next instance. We don't know how far it was from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 3, but we can say it probably wasn't that, that it probably wasn't very far off. Jesus, I mean, Peter went in there preaching, and now this conversion was 5,000. Now, who's writing the book of Acts? Luke. Same guy that wrote the book of Luke, okay? So he's telling you now there's at least a church of 7,000 people in a manner of potentially months. Huh? I got, maybe, maybe my math is off. Yeah. I said at least, yeah, 8,120, there you go, 8,120. But we don't know that because the previous chapter said they were adding to the, uh, adding to the scripture, adding to the church daily. So we, we can say there was at least 8,120, you know, not, not to mention how many people that have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost on a daily basis as they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and breaking the bread and fellowship and prayers, everything that makes you an apostolic believer. Praise God. Amen. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. But I want you to notice the amount of revival that they had initially. What's stopping us from having that revival right now? I would agree with you. You said it. Lack of faith, and I'll add one, labor. Well, which is in God, because God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Laborers, you know. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Evidence things, yeah. 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 Yeah, it, I, I'll, I'll, I'll attribute to a, a couple of things. Let me add to what you said. Faith is not just a mental assent or belief. Remember, faith without works is dead. So they obeyed the word of God, Jesus' word, what he told them to do. And they got the results. He told them to go and preach. To go and teach. And so Peter and John, I mean, if you go back to Acts chapter 3, it's not a particularly impressive expositor of the word of God. It's a very simple demonstration of the gospel with a few scriptures. And based off of that preaching alone, he was able to get 5,000. Because he took the gospel. Now remember, Peter, this, this what, what, he's preaching to a harvest of 5,000. Let me, okay, let me make it make sense. If Peter and John were to do what we do today, this preaching would have happened among the 3,000 that he already got saved. Am I making sense? Chew on that for a second. Because the American model of church, everybody come here to me, including the people who are already saved and converted, and then I'll preach here an evangelistic message. But in this model, nobody in this picture is saved that we know of except for Peter and John. So they're literally at a harvest field full of 5,000 people. Yeah, but the difference is, are they following the commandment of God? That we don't know, probably not, because the fruit's not there. When you marry the faith with the, with the obedience to the commandment, you've got to get a result. It's one thing I was watching, it was, uh, it was a commentator, it was a comment, 
by Billy Cole, Evangelist Billy Cole. And this, 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 this prophet of God, evangelist, missionary, he's seen over hundreds of thousands of people receive the Holy Ghost. One of his Ethiopian service revival, he saw over 100, and I think it was 18,000 people receive the Holy Ghost in one service. There's videos out there on YouTube, and it is amazing. Kind of hard to tell what's going on because the language and the translation and the, root, the, the rudimentary speaker system they have, but just the roar. You see this, this, this people, a sea of people as far as you can see. Everybody's getting the Holy Ghost. And this is what he said. He said, well, God just tells me what he's going to do. And I show up. <laughs> so simple. That, but but that, that implies some things. It implies, one, you've been sent of God. Two, you have a connection and relationship with God in prayer. Three, you have the faith to act on what he's going to do. And you marry all of that, and it's going to produce a result. So if God's, you know, if God, what, what we don't see in this scripture is maybe John or Peter and John already knew we need to go to the temple today because God's going to do something great there. And they get there and there's a guy that needs healing and boom, they're there in the will of God. They already know it. And then they go inside and start preaching. Boom, 5,000 saved. They're there in the will of God. There's not a question of what's going to happen. It's the same thing with Paul. We're, we're, we're not there yet, but if you go a little further in the scriptures, Paul is praying in the Holy Ghost because he wants to go over to Asia, and the Holy Ghost tells him no. And he wants to go to another place. I can't remember the name of it, and the Holy Ghost tells him no. It was like two or three places he wanted to go where the Holy Ghost said no. And then finally he gets a dream of a guy in Macedonia calling him saying, come here. And he said, I perceive that the Lord is calling me over to Macedonia. And he gets over to Macedonia and he meets Lydia and she finances his revival. And he gets over there and him and Silas are put in prison and then they get beaten. And then they pray and then the prison doors open and they go reach the jailer and get his whole family back. All that was arranged by God. So he's there knowing good and full well is, and he's in the will of God. What we do a lot of times, we shoot from the hip. We're going outreach. Well, did God tell us to go there? Or did we think it was a good idea to go there? Hello. Hold on a second. I'm coming to you. Did God instruct us? See, faith, sometimes we have faith, sister, Samara, but our faith is in our ideas. Uh, we have an idea for this event. We have an idea to go and reach here, but they're not God ideas. That's why we've got to re, we, we got to read that. Uh, that's why the scripture says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can't go beyond that. We got to really get reconnected to God and figure out where is God calling us and how is he calling us and what. And then we just show up in faith and say, Lord, I'm here. Do what you'd will. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. And because now this is what they had that maybe was a more visible example than what we have. They saw how Jesus operated. And Jesus would spend hours apart in prayer before he did anything separate himself and go in prayer. And he'd come back and say, all right, we're going over here. But where did he get this idea from? Well, in prayer. Yes, sir. Yeah, lean not on your own understanding, but all your ways acknowledge him. Yes, sir. And he will direct thy paths. So this is something I just told the outreach team just, just, just a little bit ago. I said we need to marry our prayer efforts with our outreach efforts and get some God ideas. And I guarantee you we'll see more miracles We'll see more conversions. We'll see more deliverance because we're showing up at something that is God-ordained. And when you show up at something that's God-ordained, all you got to really do is just show up. There are battles that they didn't even have to fight in the Old Testament. They just had to kind of show up and praise God and God did the work. It's a much easier way to go, but it does require it does require. One, to be full of the Holy Ghost. Two, it requires a connection to God in prayer to receive our marching orders. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, so let's, let's go to 
Uh, well, I want to stop on the 5,000. Somebody go ahead, Brother John. Uh-oh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Everybody knew he was who he was, yeah. Uh-huh. I agree. Okay, let's let's keep it going. Five thousand, verse number five. Excuse me, Acts chapter four, verse number five. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and the elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Yes. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, uh -huh. if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, yep. be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, uh -huh. whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Yep. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Uh -huh. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Ooh, pause there. Now, this will preach right here. This is a master of a doctrine class right here. Because they asked a question that lots of us should pay attention to. First of all, they arrested Peter and John. They said, we not having none of this Jesus foolishness in this temple. Okay, so they said, I already told you that was going to happen. Uh, because they caused the uproar. People start believing in the name of Jesus. And the same thing they did to Jesus or tried to do to Jesus, they did to Peter and John. Okay? And so um, they, the Bible says they, they, they took them. Look at this. Peter's talking to the rulers, verse 5. He's talking to the elders. He's talking to scribes. And Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and as many, look at this, as were of the kindred of the... So this is all they brothers and all their kind. Now, this is Peter and John. We know Peter was over the age of 20 when he walked with Jesus because Jesus told him to go pay a temple tax for himself and Peter. So Peter was over the age of 20. John was not. So Jesus, let's say three and a half years of ministry, Peter's mid-20s, John might be an early teenager. Or, I mean, excuse me, a late teenager, 16, 17, 18, John. So you got a, a mid-20s guy, and you got a, a, a hyphen. You got a mid-20s guy, and you got a, a Y move, college freshman, standing before high priest, Elders, scribes, Pharisees, rulers, kindred, all their class. <laughs> and look at the boldness. Yes, sir, you had a question? It might have been, but so I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm much older than what Peter would have been in this particular scripture. So I'm not going to tell my age because, you know, nature has already confirmed it <laughs> a little bit. Praise God. But <laughs> thank you, Jesus. I still feel young. You know, don't make me feel old. I'm, I, 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 thank you, Jesus. I, I still get called young. Y'all don't, don't come for me, Brother Bo. You trying? <laughs> but the boldness. And, 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 okay, now put yourself in the position of these, these, these elders and, and high, who are these young little whippersnappers? They're not even old enough to serve as a priest. You got to be 30 to serve as a priest, let alone the high priest. So they're looking, this is literally one generation looking at another generation at this point in contempt and disgust. What have you come here to upset our establishment with? I love God how he does things. He said in one portion in the gospels, he said, I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast revealed this unto babes. I'm talking about his disciples. God, I'm telling you, I, I think we need to set these youth on fire. 
go and upset some things. Because Jesus spent a lot of time rebuking elders for that particular reason. Yeah, that cup is already full of foolishness. But he took these young boys and set them on fire. And this is, this is a, young, a young person type of thing. They're not thinking about any of the consequences of what they're doing. You know that's how you are when you're... you're not, <laughs> Yeah, and what are we going to do? We're going to go preach in the most dangerous, hostile environment full of thousands of believers that don't believe in what we are? 50 days after Jesus already died and was killed on the cross and they're threatening to kill every one of his followers? Yeah, let's go do it. God is with us. <laughs> and they go, which comes back to the faith thing. This is, this is you know, these guys are fired up. Go ahead, sis. G- yeah. And so can you imagine this, this fiery Peter? Because they asked them, this is a doctrinal question. By what power or by what name have you done this? And they need to ask every Baptist preacher, every preacher that baptizes in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, by what power or by what name are you operating in? Hello? And what's Peter's answer? By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised, there's no question who he's talking about, whom God raised up from the dead. Actually, that's not all he said. If we be questioned, <laughs> you can preach this if you want to. Um, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, does this man stand here before you whole. So Peter points his finger. I I don't think you can say this without pointing. (laughs) I couldn't say this without pointing. (laughs) Whom you, now he's pointing his finger at men that have the power to kill him in the same way they did for Jesus. The same high priest. That consented to Jesus' death, Peter is preaching to, pointing his Holy Ghost-filled finger at. <sighs> Talk about preservation of life. He's not, no, he's full of the Holy Ghost right here. The boldness has empowered him. Then he quotes scripture at him. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head. That's Isaiah he's quoting. Which has become the head of the corner. Verse number 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So now, this whole event has arranged an audience for Peter and John to go and bring the gospel and the method of salvation to the elders, to the high priests, to the rulers, to the scribes, to all of their kids. You see how God, you might think that, you might reading this, you might think that somehow this is an unfortunate thing that they were captured. God saw it as an opportunity. I can imagine the smug look on their faces as they got Peter locked up, thinking to themselves, we have the power to kill you. And Peter and John sitting there with the knowledge of that, I'm here to witness to you. Don't you know that God will put you through affliction so you can witness to somebody else? I'll say that again. Don't you know God will have you go through affliction? That's why you can't be complaining. Imagine if Peter had had all of one of some of our attitudes. Can you believe this is unfair? They locked us up for preaching Jesus. This cot's not comfortable. These handcuffs are too tight. We complain too much, church. We complain too much. In this instance, this, this arrest that they are under is in the will of God. And it got them an audience that they could not have obtained any other way. I'll say that again. It got them an audience that they could not have obtained any other way. It came by affliction. It came through persecution. It came through taking them through an event that they probably would not have signed up for. That Peter just probably... I don't know, 57 days prior would have denied Jesus trying to escape. Now he's looking at that fear straight in the face, pointing at his captors as he understands he's the only method of salvation that they have. He's the witness to them. 
So while they think he's got, you know, they think that, you know, we've got the upper hand up on Peter and John. Peter and John like, <laughs> and they're about to see it because they say, look, who do you think we should obey? You or God? We're going to keep doing what we're doing. But God will often do you. He arranged an audience before these guys that they would have never been able to got themselves. And now they can't say they didn't hear the gospel. Because they know who Jesus, they know who you're talking about. They're the ones that consented to his crucifixion. They're the ones that said, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus, and let his blood be up on our shoulders and our children. Remember that? Peter's talking to the same people. And John is sitting there as his witness. So now the gospel has come to the leaders of Judea. And they have no excuse. Yes, Brother John. Oh, yeah. Now look at this, verse 13. Go ahead, verse 13. I know I'm taking a long time to get through this, but it preaches, so I can't help it. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, uh -huh. they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Been with Jesus. Go ahead. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Didn't do that. But when they had commanded them to go outside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? Uh -huh. For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. Yep. And we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Uh, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but sp speak the things which we have seen and heard. Uh -huh. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. All right, pause right there. So after Peter preaches, and hopefully I convinced that it was bold preaching, the Bible says when they saw the boldness of Peter... And perceive that they were unlearned and ignorant men. What that means is that these men are sitting up here quote, quoting scripture. That only somebody that had been through the establishment processes of being a Pharisee's apprentice should know. Had been to Bible college. Now if you do some studying, the Pharisees and Sadducees would take apprentices. Teenagers. Kind of like Jesus did. Okay? But these guys weren't a part of that establishment. They had never been through that process. So they're not supposed to be this well-versed in Scripture. Especially when the time where to have a scroll of the Scriptures would be very expensive. You have a scribe to copy it for you. You're like, okay, so these are unlearned and ignorant men, but here you are quoting me Scripture, and you're bold. We remember a guy that used to do this and had a ragtag group of guys follow him. You've been with Jesus. Yes, sir. Their hearts, their hearts hardened. That's their issue. It's deep. Now, remember, these are the same ones that talk with Jesus. These are probably the, some of the ones that consented to him being smitten when he was first captured. Remember, they put him on the thing over his eye and beat him and said, prophesy to us. These are the same group of people. That's their hearts, definitely. So it's not like Peter knew that, you know, but Peter's fulfilling what he said. Preach the gospel to every creature, even the evil ones. <laughs> Praise God. And so they said they, they're unlearned and they're ignorant. Yeah, they're fishermen. Fishermen. And in some people's eyes, if you haven't graduated from this established institute of higher biblical theological learning, and now I'm not coming against education, but education is not a mandate or an, uh, or, or, uh, an anointing of God. Just because you got the education means nothing. Are you called and are you sent? Hello. And God has a history of using people that are uneducated, unlearned, not warriors, not kings. He takes, he takes unlearned shepherds and does wonders with them, doesn't he? Hello, somebody. He takes, he takes Gideons that are hiding and says, thou mighty man of valor. Come on, take shepherds, make some kings, take some murderers, turns them into deliverers. So you don't need the world's qualifications to do a work for God. So, but in their mind, where is unlearned guys at? He's been with Jesus. Now look at this. Okay, 
They beholding, verse 14, beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Hello, somebody. But when they had commanded them to go aside in the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. So you might, you might not like the doctrine, but you can't deny the power. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Nothing. Nothing. Couldn't get it done. They're kids. Young adults. Faith. Full of the Holy Ghost. Power. Boom. And these guys know it. And the reason why, look at this. Uh, verse 17, uh, excuse me. What shall we do to these men? Verse 16, that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them. This, by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. It's not the miracle that, 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 that stopped them. It's the image and the way it's spread or has the potential of spreading. Before all the rest of Jerusalem. Remember, they don't care about God or the power of God. They care about their influence and image in front of the people. It's Saul number two. Saul didn't care about being right with God. When he messed up, all he wanted to do was have Samuel come out and worship with him. That, that he could save face in front of the people. Okay? Saul, didn't, Saul actually wanted to kill David well before he actually tried. But because David was very popular with the people, he had to go try to set David up to be killed by the Philistines. Remember that? Go collect some foreskins. Remember that? Okay. And when did Saul really turn on David? When the people started singing David's praises more than they were singing his praises. Saul slain his thousands, but David his. So it's the spirit of Saul resurrected. It's one previous kingdom persecuting the incoming kingdom. They're supposed to be on the same team, but they're not. And they're not getting anything done, just like Saul wasn't getting nothing done. Here they go. Now, they can't really persecute Peter and John like they want to because Peter and John are very popular with the people. And the last thing they want to do is become unpopular with the it's politics, people. Because if, if they go and start beating Peter and John right now, the people are going to think to themselves, well, why would these high priests just beat the men that brought a miracle to this guy? So they can't do that. But they still got to address the problem. So here's what we'll do. You Holy Ghost filled people, you apostolic Pentecostals, you stop preaching in Jesus' name. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 But God had put them in a in a in a in a space where, you know, now they can't be right now they can't be touched. Cuz Saul eventually flips. He doesn't care who thinks, how he thinks. He just wants David dead. And that's what's getting ready to happen. These guys are getting ready to flip where they just want these apostles dead. And once they see it's, it pleases them to start killing them, they start offing them. So that, 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 that's going to change. But my point to you is that they can't stop the power. And they can't right openly persecute these preachers because they're popular. What they think they can do is stop you preaching. Not preaching. Just don't preach that name. You can preach in some obfuscated name of God all you want to. Just don't preach in the name of Jesus. You can pray to some, some elusive God. We pray to God. No, 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 no. They'll let you pray to God anywhere. But if you mention Jesus, that's what the world's trying to do. Shut down the Jesus name people. We happened just at Faith in Blue this, this, past, this past event we was at. 
Preacher guy's been talking about some, some you know, oh, we, nobody has a lock on God. And this is supposed to be a Christian pastor saying this. I said the devil's a liar. But Pastor Collins got up there and preached it. Jesus, we're preaching. I don't care if you like it. I'm not here to, to, to please your emotions or to, or to be palatable and accepted among the masses. We're here to bring the gospel. And that's what Peter said. Listen, this is the only time the church is supposed to get involved in civil disobedience. Y'all hear me. This is the only time when they tell you to stop doing what God told you to do, then you have a mandate to stand on the word of God. That's how I knew COVID was messed up because they told us to stop having church. <laughs> uh, you want me to stay six feet away from my neighbor at Walmart? Okay, I might be able to obey that. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. You want me to pay my taxes? All right, I'll pay the taxes. You want me to stop having church? Oh, no, sir. Not doing that whatsoever. Well, don't you know that's a law? I don't care what your law says. You want me to stop preaching in the name of Jesus? Oh, no, sir. I'm not doing that. No. Peter said, whether it be right for us to obey you or obey God, you judge. But we can only do that which we've seen and heard. Hello, somebody. We've got a mandate against all persecution. I've got to stand on the word of God. And if, and if it comes to that, you're going to have to shake yourself in the Holy Ghost. Go pray and get some faith and boldness in Jesus' name and make up your mind. We're not deviating from any iota of what Jesus told us to come here and told us to do. We're not doing it. And so they said, okay, well, we can't beat them. They're very popular, so let's just threaten them to not speak in that name anymore. But Peter said, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken you more to God, you judge. And we cannot speak but the things we've seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the, verse 21, because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was, a, was, was above 40 years old, whom this miracle of healing was shown. Let's finish out this chapter. We'll pause here for today, 23 to the end. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus mm -hmm. and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and mm -hmm. they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness all right, pause right there we'll, we'll, we'll end right there today so when Peter and John took this news back to the assembly the assembly the church prayed which at this time has grown to like we said over 8,000 people and when they prayed the place was shaken so it was an earthquake. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with what? That's what we need in this day and age. We need faith, of course, but we need boldness. Because this is the first time an attempt persecution has come to the church. They were threatened, don't preach Jesus no more. What are we going to do? Are we going to let that shut us up? So what do you do when you're scared or you're threatened? You go pray. Ask God to give you strength and boldness to keep going forward. And we'll, we'll cover the rest of what happened next time in Acts chapter 4. And then we'll, we'll, our, our birth series will stop at 5. We'll hop into some other elements. Yes, sir. Hey, even what? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's hypothetical. I don't, I don't really know. I, they have the power to 
killed Jesus, and Jesus spoke less than what these guys spoke. Um, yeah, but I don't. I wouldn't even say that Peter and John attempted to defend themselves. They asked, "How does man get healed?" Peter gave him the gospel. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. He he called him out. <laughs> uh, this is the movement you tried to stop. <laughs> Remember, remember when you set those soldiers in front of the grave to try to stop us from stealing the body even though none of us were there even when he rose up? <laughs> we just talked about that. They just tried to stop the movement, and here they are confronted with it again. I'm thinking they're thinking like, oh, gosh, here we go again. So um, how much power do they really have if they can be controlled by the people? That's my point. They said, we can't, they tried to find something, the reason to beat them. I mean, can you imagine, again, you got you to gotta put this in the realm of what we're experiencing and going through right now and what's happened all throughout humanity. They're not even interested in the gospel. They're not interested in this miracle, this healing. They simply want to know how they can stop it to maintain their power, control, and authority. And if they could have found just cause to make an example of Peter and John in front of all the people that the people would accept, they would have done it. They would have took them right and flogged them, made a public example. These men preach blasphemy. Shh, shh. They couldn't do that because everybody's glorifying God for what just happened. So... They were bound by public perception or the thing that they consider. They consider they would rather, they would rather the opinions of men, the praises of men. Yeah. Oh, this is political. <laughs> this is political. Let's make a public example. Yeah, well, it didn't work. <laughs> you have something? Yeah. I get, yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was crazy. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. It's the same. It's the same. People think it's, it's, it's a little different based on the tourist areas, but you're, you're right. The, the perception is still the, at least the, you get killed, yeah. You got you go to the wrong place. You're gonna you're gonna die for this, um, but yeah. But at at the end of the day, uh, all this is by the direction of Jesus Christ, and that's what I want to emphasize. There, these these men are following their marching orders, following their marching orders, and and this is why I say we have to study the Book of Acts because it is our mission and goal as the Apostolic Church to mirror and replicate, to pattern ourselves after this type of church because the American model and really mainstream church today is not like this, not like this at all. And so, I mean, I guess we can call it a blessing that we live in a nation where it is openly accepted to say anything that you want pretty much or worship any God that you want. But look at what an environment of persecution actually produces. How many of you would be that much more on fire for God tomorrow if overnight they said no preaching Jesus? Boom. Were you raising your hand because you got a question or are you just agreeing with me? You see how persecution in the right environment can produce something that comfort and ease won't? You know what I'm saying? So... Kind of changes what you would perceive as a blessing, huh? Yeah, but if we want to live at peace with all men, that, 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 that's good too. But we got we to gotta be willing to do the will of God. And I've seen through the scriptures that God will cause. God will shake some things up as we're getting ready to find out by the first martyr. He'll shake things up to propel them into their destiny. Amen. Um. Which brings me to my homework question. One of the 
deacons that was chosen, his name, Stephen, he was the first martyr. What were the other guys' names? <laughs> I know, that's why I'm asking the question. Now you got to go back and read it, because everybody knows Stephen. I said, all y'all know Stephen, at least. You guys should be teaching this Bible study. I know. That's why I'm asking it. Go read Acts chapter 6 for yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any final questions before we pray out tonight? Nope. Praise God. I'll have them start teaching this thing tomorrow. We'll rotate out these guys. Get the youth going back there. Get the kids going in the room over here. We'll do three, four classes at a time. Thank you, Jesus. All right. That's how I got started teaching, teaching the youth. Taught them for about four or five years, six or seven times through the sport and God's work. Amen. All right, let's, let's close out in prayer tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, take the food home with you. If you didn't get some, we don't want to leave it over. Uh, but I'll see you guys this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Thank you, Lord, for the mandate that you've given us, Lord God, in these last days to take the whole gospel, Lord God, to the whole world. And I pray, Lord God, that you would put a fresh burden on our hearts, Lord, to seek after your face, Lord, to seek after your will, Lord God, for clear direction, Lord Jesus, Lord God, clear direction and instruction, Lord God, for you've given us power, Lord God. By the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Lord God, you've given us power. Help us, Lord God, to use that power, Lord God, in conjunction with your word and your will to accomplish, Lord, your will in this earth before we leave, Lord God. Oh, God, for we want to walk in the ways that you would walk, Lord God, and do the things that you would have us to do, Lord. I pray that you help us, Lord God. I pray that you give us a keen ear in prayer for instruction, Lord. Give us faith to execute on the instructions that you give, Lord God, that your glory can be made manifest in this world, Lord God. Oh God, that we are ambassadors for your name's sake, Lord God. We are called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light for such a time as this. Father, I pray that you would have your way in our hearts and our minds and even in our lives, Lord. Give us traveling mercies as we travel home tonight, Lord God, that we make it home safely. We'll be careful to give you the glory and to give you the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Praise God.